Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea, and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair or something like that would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. Okay, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents, and so on. Then. We do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. That's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it, but I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many, otherwise the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? Okay. Now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative, say one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them. Then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr. Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, how much money it takes to keep the place running, and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar too. He can rally lots of support. And Mr. Sims, our member of Parliament, he is very busy. But I think I can persuade him to come, or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith, the journalist. Yes. Well, he's the editor of the local paper now, and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free. And he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. 
We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind, Freddie Smith and. Oh yes, Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates, do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fete. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Dr. Perkins, Mr. Sims, that journalist. Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him, and the vicar and Mr. Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me. That's seven. That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I understand that you all own your own home, and some of you may be interested in buying additional property here in the city. So I hope you will find the information I am going to share with you useful and informative. I'm going to talk about the situation with property here in the city. The city centre of any area is obviously going to have the highest prices, and as more and more people are competing for houses in this area, both renting and buying are becoming increasingly difficult. It is most people's dream to one day own their own house. House ownership gives us a feeling of having achieved something, and we can see clearly what we have worked so hard for all our lives. It can give us a sense of security for our old age and a knowledge that we will hopefully have something to pass on to our children. However, buying a house, particularly for first-time buyers, is becoming more and more difficult, not only due to increasing prices, but also because of the need for a substantial deposit. For younger people, buying their first home is very difficult and often impossible. Young couples who cannot get the deposit together. Need to rent for a long time and sometimes forever. While traditionally homes near the centre of the city have been the most desirable, people are now looking further afield. This has happened for a number of reasons. The main one being that our style of work is changing, along with that of other countries such as the USA. In certain professions, for example, sales and computing, it is no longer necessary for people to be based in an office full time. More and more people are beginning to work from home, which means they can avoid the hustle and bustle of rush hour traffic jams into work, and have more freedom to choose to live in a more rural and peaceful location. My company deals with finding property for both purchasers and renters in the city area. One of my main roles within the company is to find investment properties for people who wish to plan ahead for their future. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. An investment property is usually at the cheaper end of the market. People buy investment properties not to live in, but in addition to their own home in order to rent it out to other people. The advantage of putting your savings into property for the future is that you can be pretty certain that, as a long-term investment, your money will safely increase in value in line with inflation. Many people are turning to property investment instead of pension schemes, as we hear the horror stories of countries such as the UK, where people have invested all their lives into their pension schemes to find that now their money is relatively worthless. Houses automatically earn what is known as capital gains. That is, for every year you own the property, it becomes more valuable and often gives a better rate of interest on your money than most banks do. However, that is not to say there are no risks. There are people who buy property when the market is high and prices are inflated beyond their true value, only to find that when the housing market slows down, they are in a state of negative equity. Negative equity is a situation that arises when you owe more for the house than the house itself is worth. In short, the best advice is to be aware of the ups and downs of the housing market. 
property investment, if handled correctly, can be enormously satisfying. I hope that this has given you an insight into the basics of the property market. Thank you for listening. Please raise your hand if you have any questions and I will try to be of assistance. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in. Ah, it's you, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, it's about that essay on non-verbal communication. I'd like a bit of advice, if that's all right. By all means. That's what I'm here for. How can I help you? Um, it's about that survey you asked us to carry out about body language. Oh, yes. I asked you to investigate what sort of touching is permissible between friends of the same sex and friends of the opposite sex. That's it. And then you wanted us to go on to compare the answers we obtained from people from our own culture with the answers of people from other cultures. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult. There are students here from dozens of cultures, including Asia and the Middle East. Go and ask them. That's the problem. I'm not sure how to word the questions. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Go and ask them. That's the problem. I'm not sure how to word the questions. I think I've got far too many. People don't want to be bothered answering them all. Is that the list of questions you have with you? Let's have a look. Hmm, I see. Your basic idea is fine. You've got a checklist of the parts of the body we mostly use to touch people with and a checklist of the parts of other people's bodies that we usually touch. But you don't have to go right through the list asking a separate question about each item. You can make your questionnaire much shorter if you ask open questions. Open questions? What are they? Sometimes we call them WH questions. What, when, where. Those are examples. Oh, I see. Yes. We learned about them in grammar. I hadn't realised how useful they turn out to be. I could just ask one open question about each subject and tick the answers I receive. That's right. Now, let's have a look at the list of parts of the body you're going to ask about. Um, I see. You've got the head, arm and hand and, oh, it's over the page, the back, leg and foot. What about the shoulder and the thigh? They're important areas, and there are some others you should include too. Oh yes, of course. I was in a rush and forgot those. Um, what about asking people how they feel about being touched? Surely, it's hard for people to put that sort of feeling into words. Yes, you're right. That's why it's essential to work out a rating scale for each response. Can you tell me a bit about how to use rating scales? Well, there's no way to measure how strongly a person feels about something, of course. All we can go on is what they report about their feelings. So what we do is offering them choices of ways to express how they feel. Very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That would be an example of a rating scale. In this case, as your survey is only a small trial sample, I suggest you use that three point rating scale I've just described. Very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That'll be enough to enable you to draw some broad conclusions. You may go on to refine your survey later if you decide to specialise in the study of non-verbal aspects of behaviour. Thank you. I'm much clearer now. Could I ask you one last question? I'm afraid I've got a brain like a sieve, but I just can't remember the technical term you told us for the study of touch. It sounded like happy, but of course it isn't. Oh, you mean haptics. H-A-P-T-I-C-S. Of course, haptics. That's it. Happy to be of service. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. 
Cheese is one of those foods that we tend to take for granted, as always having been with us. And it's odd to think that someone somewhere must have discovered the process to make cheeses. That takes place today. In the studio to tell us all about it is Monica Maxwell. Today we all know that the process of making cheeses takes place when microorganisms get into milk and bring about changes in its physical and biochemical structure. Well, obviously we don't know who discovered the process, but it's thought that it came from Southwest Asia about eight thousand years ago. In the early time, there were mainly two types of cheeses. One of them was rather tasteless and bland in the case of the so-called fresh cheeses, which are eaten immediately after the milk has coagulated, and another one was rough-tasting and salty in the case of the ripened cheeses, which are made by adding salt to the soft fresh cheese and allowing other biochemical processes to continue, so that a stronger taste and a more solid texture resulted. The ancient Romans changed all that. They were great pioneers in the art of cheese making, and the different varieties of cheese they invented and the techniques for producing them spread with them to the countries they invaded. This spread of new techniques took place between about 60 B.C. and 300 A.D. You can still trace their influence in the English word cheese, which comes ultimately from the Latin word. Cassius. That's C A S E U S. At this stage in history, people weren't aware, in a scientific way, of the role of different microorganisms and enzymes in producing different types of cheese. But they knew from experience that cheese's tastes were relevant to something. If you kept your milk or your pre-cheese mixture at a certain temperature or in a certain environment, things would turn out in a certain way. In the 19th century, with the increasing knowledge about microorganism, there came the next great step forward in cheese making. Once it was known exactly which microorganism was involved in the different stages of producing a cheese and how the presence of different microorganisms affected the taste, it was possible to introduce them deliberately and to industrialize the process. Nowadays, cheese is made on a large scale in factories. Although the small producer working from his dairy farm continued to exist and still exists today, cheese making moved very much into the world of technology and industrial processes. Although, because the aim is still to produce something that people like to eat, there's still an important role for human judgment. People still go round tasting the young cheese at different stages to see how it's getting on, and may add a bit of this or that to improve the final taste. Whatever the scale of production, there is still room for the development of art alongside the technology.